So, uh, so I'll just kick off then, if I may. Um, so I, my name's Rosie Fraser, and um, I am the project manager for the Tales from the Crypt project. Um, this is a project which has been funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and um, Culture Seeds and the Diocese of London. And it is a community-based research project um, revolving around the tales from the people who are buried in the crypt. As part of the project, um, Rebecca Preston has been researching the history of Holy Trinity Church and uh, all its comings and goings um, since it was built up to today. Um, so this is part of the Tales from the Crypt project and she is going to do a brief synopsis of her research findings um, and actually her paper is on the Diocese of London website if people would like to download it and read it separately. So um, after this talk, Rebecca will have some time for questions and answers. No, stop it, get out. Um, we'll have some time for questions and answers as well. So please do think of any questions you might want to ask um, as she goes along. Sorry for that. Uh, over to Rebecca and then I'm going to mute, okay? Thank you, Rosie. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's lovely to, for you all to join us. Um, as Rosie's just explained, the Diocese of London has commissioned new research with the support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund to assist with the restoration of the Cloudsley Centre, the former Church of Holy Trinity. This was in partnership with Islington Heritage, the Archives and Museum, and other partners who are come to. Much of the research has been undertaken through the volunteer project, Tales from the Crypt, um, led by Dr. Susan Sked, which has thrown new light on the history of the local people who were buried in the vaults beneath the church and a great deal else besides. This tremendous work, and, and it really is quite impressive, uh, reveals not only exciting new social histories, but also assists us greatly with understanding how the church was at the centre of the community, socially as well as architecturally. My point of part of the project was to carry out a detailed survey of manuscripts and other sources, really as many as I could lay my hands on, in order to understand the building in as much detail as possible, from the selection of the site through to alterations and repairs, up to the late 20th century. This information was shared with the volunteer historians and creators, curators and their coordinator, and in turn, they shared what they found with me. It also fed into the work that art and Christianity artists did with the pupils of New River College and to the walks planned by Islington Walks, and these are our other partners. In the longer term, the documentary research will assist the architects and others involved in conserving the building in a sympathetic manner and finding new and sustainable uses for it in the future. So my work was primarily to track changes to the building uh, and then to create a timeline of the history of the site and building, which as Rosie said, you can find on the LDF website. In addition to newspaper and other digital searches, the main archival trawls were made at London Metropolitan Archives where the parish records and diocesan papers are held at Lambeth Palace Library, the Old Church of England Record Centre, which keeps various records um, and other material, including um, a great deal at Islington Local History Centre and Museum, um, which holds invaluable material on the Clowsley Trust and the estate, as well as the church itself. Amongst the most useful of all these records were the commissioner's records, and I'll come back to the commissioner's, uh, the Vestry Minutes of Holy Trinity and of the Mother Church St Mary, and faculty papers authorising works to Holy Trinity. However, the faculties, the authorisation for works, the two major periods of alterations don't survive, or at least we didn't find them. Um, those for a reordering of the chancel in 1867 and the removal of, of the organ to the chancel in about 1885. So we had to piece this sequence together from other parish records and from newspaper reports from visual source material and by looking at the building itself. 
it'll be no spoiler to tell you that Holy Trinity was one of three chapels of ease designed for Islington by Charles Barry at this time, and which shared some of the same contractors. And because of this, I also kept an eye out for records of the other two, St Paul's Bulls Pond and St John Holloway. Parish records in particular helped plot large and small changes to the fabric and also to make sense of some conundrums. To take just one example, we couldn't quite understand some alteration, alterations that had been made to the interior of the church roof in the second half of the 20th century until we found a reference in the church logbook telling us that the right hand tower had been struck by lightning in 1963. But I'm getting ahead of myself and we need to go back to the beginning. I'm sure you will all know Cathy Ross's marvellous history of the Cloudsley Trust, which sets the history of the Stonefields or Cloudsley Estate in the context of the parish more widely. 500 years ago, a Tudor yeoman, Richard Cloudsley, gave a plot of land to the parish of St Mary with the wish that the land should be used to generate income for various purposes. And her account examines how the land owned by the charity generated income uh, and the output, what the money was used for, and who decided how it should be spent. Scroll forward 300 years and we find a plot of land of around 16 and a half acres that looks something like this. In 1811, St Mary's Vestry tried to sell the fields to the City of London um, in order to build a new cattle market as an alternative to West Smithfield. And when this plan failed, they sought to let it for house building. Thus, in 1811, after the rents had been used for repairs to the parish church of St Mary, an act allowed the trustees to grant building leases for not more than 99 years and to use the rents for repairs uh, to the church and later the Chapel of Ease. And thus the story of Clowsley Square and the residential development around it begins. The Stonefields estate was one of a series of fields on the west side of the back road, which still had a rural feel. And although Islington was fast becoming built up, it was, as you will know, still on a cattle drover's road, uh, route to West Smithfield. And the remaining fields locally, probably including the pieces of meadow which made up the stony fields, uh, were used for pasture. Thus, what became the Liverpool Road and the fields to the west would have hummed to the racket and stench of cattle on the way to slaughter and Islington was famously London's dairy. On healthy high ground mostly, the parish had long been one of London's favourite playgrounds and some of the spas, inns and tea gardens which sprang up in the parish survived into the 19th century, attracting a mixed crowd. Partly because of this and because it was on the main routes in and out, uh, in and out of town, the area north of the city walls was still the haunt of beggars, vagabonds and other menaces to those on the public highway. As the topographer Samuel Lewis reflected in 1842 in relation to this print, the paucity and situation in this part of the parish of Islington at the commencement of the present century, i.e. in 1800, are curiously shown in a print of the Reed Moat Field, drawn and published in 1796. The view is, take, is taken looking east, he says, and the nearest buildings delineated are the parish church, the workhouse, and a single row of houses in the Liverpool, then the back road. So to him, development was seen as having a civilising influence. This was echoed more than a decade later in the Illustrated London News in 1854, which noted that the site of the district parish of Holy Trinity was formerly little better than a mere waste dotted with cottages and huts, as stunted in their proportions as the majority of their inmates were in moral character. The fields were notoriously the scene of brutalising sports and the habits of the population were generally of that low caste which is common upon the borders of an overgrown city. So in short, although Islington was fast becoming developed with smart residential enclaves, it remained in many ways um, on the fringes of polite society in the 1820s. This is another view of the Stonefield estate, according to the image, uh, and presently a brick field. And even if it's not exactly on this spot, it captures the tide of suburban expansion as it met with rural and semi-rural areas. This map from the exhibition curated and designed by the volunteer team graphically highlights the transformation of the area from green fields to a network of streets between 1800 and 1860. 
The grey areas were developed by about 1800, and those in pink are the places researched by the volunteers. And um, Rosie can tell you a bit more about the exhibition at the end. Having inherited the rights to St Mary's Islington from his uncle in 1821, the charismatic minister, the Reverend Daniel Wilson, decided on the death of the incumbent in May 1824 to take up the parish. This was, as his biographer Andrew Porter remarks, to the initial dismay of a congregation not known for its evangelical vitality. Wilson embraced a wide range of evangelical causes, including foreign missions, the anti-slavery move movement, education, and church building. He feared that the Church of England can no longer serve Islington's fast-growing population. This rose from around 10,000 in 1811 to near 22,500 in 1821, and was, Wilson estimated in 1824, now around 25,000 while the parish of the Church of St. Mary and its Chapel of Ease could accommodate only two and a half thousand souls. So in that year, 1824, he and Mill appealed to the commissioners for building and promoting the building of additional churches in populous districts. In 1818, to celebrate the recent end of the Napoleonic Wars, Parliament had passed the Act for Building New Churches. And under the terms of this act and a further one in 1824, a church building commission was formed in order to fund the new churches, mainly in the neighbourhood of expanding towns and cities. So-called commissioners or Waterloo churches were thus designed to increase the number of Anglican churches to stem a feared drift to nonconformism or to the Roman Catholic Church. And also it was hoped to, as a preventative measure against uh, potential political dis uh, dissent in this revolutionary period. In his quest to raid funds for additional church accommodation, Wilson warned the commissioners that there were fewer, far fewer dissenting people in Islington than in neighbouring parishes, perhaps a reference to Clerkenwell. But he raised the spectre of local congregations slipping away if the established church failed to provide for them. And this is a portrait of Daniel Wilson in 1832 on his ordination as Bishop of Calcutta. So he made arrangements with the commissioners to build three additional chapels to accommodate 5,000 people. And by September, plans of the ground floor and galleries showing the number of sittings, how many people they could cram in, had been prepared for three new chapels of ease. The three locations, the Stonefields, Upper Holloway Way and Balls Pond, were chosen in large part because this was where the population was densest and furthest removed from the parish church of St Mary and its chapel of ease, um, St Mary Magdalene. Wilson told the commissioners that he wished to have nothing to do with plans or architects or contracts and to leave all the arrangements to the commissioners. This was due to his wish to avoid the irritation and tumults that had arisen from the great expense to the parish of erecting uh, St Mary Magdalene in 1814. And he begged the commissioners in 1825 that an extreme apprehension prevailed in the parish that the expenses for the new chapels would exceed the estimates. Each chapel was initially to be designed by a separate architect, with Barry appointed to St John's Upper Holloway. We don't know for sure why these particular architects were chosen, but in July 1825, the parish reported that it had discovered James Savage, George Bersavi and Charles Barry were known to the commissioners and, as they had executed works to their satisfaction, which was one of the commissioners' criteria, their appointment would not only be unattended with difficulty, but would probably be particularly agreeable to them. Barry was based from 1818 um, to 1827 in Ely Place on the north side of Hoban, about a mile and a half to the south of Cloudsley Square. He had recently completed a three year tour of the continent where he'd mostly studied classical architecture. On his return, he designed two cast iron Gothic churches for the commissioners in the Manchester area in uh, 1822 to 26 and another at St Peter's Brighton before he began work in Islington. Barry's wife knew Sir John Soane, who was one of the Board of Works three advisory architects. Um, Barry's biographer, the architect and art historian Matthew Digby Wyatt, believed that it was his success with the Brighton Church that led to his engagement to design a group of churches in Islington with strong stimulus from Daniel Wilson. However, Barry's second son, the Reverend Al Alfred Barry, who went into the church, believed that he had had some recommendation from Soane 
to the Islington Commission. Let's go back to the early days of the future Holy Trinity. Beginning on the 25th of March, 1824, the land on the Stonefields estate was let in parcels on building leases for periods of 81 years. It seems likely that the original plan was to leave the centre of the square as open space, or probably railed garden ground, and parish correspondence of October 1825 indicates that this would still be the case if the church did not go ahead as planned. But Wilson told the commissioners as early as July 1824 that the site of the new church was already obtained and railed in, conveniently situated in the very heart of the new buildings in the back road. Initially, as I'm sure you know, Clowsley Square was known also, or either or, as Islington Square, as you can see on the left. And for a few years, both names were used in tandem. But Islington Square was soon dropped, possibly to avoid confusion with the new Islington Square in Islington, Liverpool, and with the recently renamed Liverpool Road in Islington, London. Or perhaps because Cloudly had a more distinctive ring to it and would help attract the right sort of tenants. In July 1825, it was decided that James Savage would be asked to prepare plan specifications and estimates um, for the intended church in Stonefields, Holy Trinity, and Bersavi, uh, George Bersavi and Charles Barry would be asked to prepare plans respectively for Bulls Pond and Upper Holloway when those sites had been agreed. Very soon, it was settled that Barry's intended church at Upper Holloway, St John's, would be built on land near the horse and groom public house belonging to the Sons of the Clergy Charity, which he'd already staked out, while that at Balls Pond was to be erected on North Lord Northampton's land. James Savage submitted his proposal for a Gothic church in the style of the 15th century in August um, 1825, that's on the left, these are standard forms, they don't give you a huge amount of detail. This was highly approved by the commissioners, but required some further specifications, which meant that as it was summer and the Board of Works was on recess, the building contracts would not be put out for tender until October, and Savage worried that the ground could not be broken before spring. Meanwhile, protracted negotiations took place over exemption from a small rent charge that the new river company held on the Stonefields estate and which the parish seemed not to be aware of. As Vestry Minutes recorded, these repeated procrastinations will have the effect of postponing the actual commencement of the building until the next spring, when the tenders for the Stonefields chapel did come in. Um, HM commissioners objected that even the lowest tender tenders exceeded Savage's estimate by £5,200. Despite apologies and vigorous protestations by Savage, um, he blamed rises in the cost of labour and materials and an error by his clerk. Um, in January 1826, the parish was requested to obtain, obtain plans from another architect. And thus, in the first few months of the year, Barry had undertaken to design two of the new chapels of ease, and this is Barry's proposal on the right here. By March 1826, the commissioners had also resolved to reject Bersavi's proposal um, for the church at Bulls Pond on grounds of its style and character. I, I know no more than that. So Barry was now instructed to design all three chapels. As Wilson had stated in June 1825, the future Holy Trinity was to be the first and principal new church or chapel to be erected in the parish. And in July that year, the commissioners agreed to its sighting in the new square. However, as just indicated by the issue of the rent charge, a series of incidents led to its being the last of the three new chapels to be consecrated. Barry's revised design was for a Gothic church of the 16th century with turrets and vaults and cast iron introduced into the columns. Um, supporting the Western Gallery. Now, as this was a proposal and estimate, we don't know for sure until investigations are made. Barry is said to have burned his drawings, hence you can see I have a very limited range of images to show you at this stage in the building of the church. But given the innovative use of iron in his earlier commissioners churches, it, it seems likely um, that at least some of the Clousley Centre's fine narrow columns um, have cast iron supports. The instruction from the Church Building Commission for all its new churches was to find a way of accommodating the greatest number of persons at the smallest expense. 
Barry was asked to reduce his estimate by over a thousand pounds to eleven thousand pounds, which meant he had to scale back on parts of the design. The main contractor for Holy Trinity were Messrs. Souter, of various spellings, who under Thomas Souter were responsible for all the digging, bricklaying, masonry, plastering, and slating. Souter was described in a parliamentary commission of 1826 as a builder of great eminence in Golden Lane Barbican and a man well acquainted practically with sewer works. He had been involved with the campaign to ban the, um, the use of boys to climb and sweep chimneys early in the 1800s and was a liveryman of the Tyler's Company. The clerk of works at Holy Trinity was one Benjamin Davis, about whom I know no more. During the summer of 1826, Barry and Souter found it necessary to turn the course of a sewer which ran through the site of the church, probably from the back road. The commissioners of sewers insisted that the sewer be made in such a way um, to raise the cost to £159 and changed his, um, he was already working on it, um, and to which they would only contribute £66. Gravel pits were then found below the general footings of the main walls, which Barry estimated would cost another £55 to correct. But works progressed and the first stone was laid on the 15th of July, 1826. At Barry's suggestion, the traditional foundation stone ceremony was abandoned at both Holy Trinity and St Paul's in order to make up for the additional expenses. And I thought I'd show you this report in the morning advertiser on the ceremony held for the um, foundation stone laying at St John's Holloway in 1826 and give you an idea of their importance within local society. It was attended by the Archbishop, the Bishop of London and clergy and church wardens, Barry as architect holding his plans and the contractors with a silver trowel. And you can see here that the procession to the church was headed by the street keeper, followed by the parish school children, the band, the contractors, and onwards through the hierarchy in reverse order, followed at the end by the archbishop. And they were attended by an audience of ladies from a specially constructed viewing platform with several hundred others gathered around. So this was a major parish event, as well as a Masonic ritual, with a dinner given afterwards at the Highbury Tavern. Back at Holy Trinity, the building began in earnest in September 1826, and at Christmas, when the men had stopped work until next spring, the plinth was set all round and covered up to protect it from frost. By June 1827, the whole of the wall of the buildings were carried up to the aisle roofs, the gallery timbers were fixed, and the nave pillars were in a forward state. The roof slating was progressing nicely in November, and the turrets were due to be finished by Christmas. Other than the names of the clerk of works and the main contractors, we know little of the men, you know, as usual, who did the work. Um, they tend to be hidden. So it was very nice to come across this scrap of paper in the St Mary Parish files at um, LMA. This tells us that there were 117 men on site and must date from around December of um, 1828, when the commissioners reported that the whole of the exterior was completed. The plastering was in a forward state, Nearly the whole of the joiners' work was prepared, and part of it, including the gallery floors, was, was in place. Perhaps this note was made by Davis, the clerk's clerk of works. The contractors for the carpentry and joinery were Zechariah and James Bowden, or Bowden, of Market Street, Clerkenwell. Fowler and Jones were the Smith and founders. John Hardyman undertook the plumbing, painting and glazing. James Brookman made the furniture for all three chapels the stained glass altar window and the, at the sister churches is, as you'll know, by William Willimant, author of Regal Heraldry. According to Willimant, the cost of this window was partly covered by the Cloudsley Estate and partly by private sub subscription, but we found no more about this. James Walker enclosed the chapel grounds at a cost of nearly £400. The bells for all three chapels were made by Thomas Mears, famously of the White Chapel Bell Foundry. There is but little to do now at Cloudsley Square Church, Barry wrote to the commissioners in December 1828. When, in early January, the stained glass began to be put in, he wrote again to recommend that wirework protection should be installed at the same time, given that it was within a stone's reach of the road. 
The deeds to the Stonefields estate land and the removal of the new river company's rent charge were finally agreed and signed in early 1829, and Holy Trinity was finally consecrated by the Bishop of London on the 19th of March, 1829. Here we have two views um, from around the time of opening, and that on the right is by local artist Thomas Hosner Shepherd. The church had cost £11,500, funded partly by the commissioners and partly by the parish. It contained 2,009 seats, 850 of which were free. The Bishop of London consecrated the church and the Reverend Wilson delivered a most impressive sermon. Most of the congregation, as you'd imagine, um, at the consecration ceremony were local residents, but among those who applied for tickets were the carpenter, James Bowden, and Barry himself. Timothy Russell built the organs for all three churches uh, with deal cases designed by Barry. And at Holy Trinity, the organ was installed in the organ loft above the West Gallery shortly after consecration. According to a long article that year in the Gentleman's Magazine by E.J. Carlos, before the erection of the new Islington churches, there was only room for one in 12. There is now accommodation for one in four. Barry's attention was now upon two new London churches dedicated to St. Peter. St. Peter Saffron Hill, also built by the suitors and consecrated in 1832. And you can see that its West End is not entirely dissimilar to Holy Trinity uh, with castellated pepper pot turrets, and, and that's now gone. And St. Peter's River Lane Islington, uh, consecrated in 1835, seen here before its alteration. And of course, on the evening of 16th of October, 1834, a fire broke out in the Palace of Westminster. And from that time onwards, much of Barry's attention um, would be on the building um, of the new palace. And I don't need to show you a picture of that. So what happened next at Holy Trinity? I thought I'd spend the rest of the talk just running through how the building changed. On the left is a rare image um, of a peopled view of the interior when the church was new, and this is now lost, which is why it's a, a photograph of a photocopy. You can see the free seats in the middle aisle and box pews and galleries to each side, and, and a contemporary exterior on the right. A well for spring water was dug by the suitors in 1831. Gaslight was reportedly introduced by 1842, allowing more evening services. And in 1846, the church was closed while more than 70 pounds of repair work and cleaning was done. This is the church in about 1850 with St Mary in the distance. Burial ceased in the vaults in 1855 under the 1850s Burials Act, by which time the parish burial board had purchased part of the site of the St Pancras Cemetery at Finchley. The first major works to Holy Trinity took place in the autumn of 1867. This was in part to correct the very defective state of the building, which had not been repaired for 20 years, but it was also an opportunity to make change changes at the East End, um, which were then currently happening in lots of places. An architect unnamed in the early reports prepared specifications for necessary repairs, costing 1,200 pounds. And he also pro proposed improvements um, for a further 800. The works were completed at a total cost of £1,775, so they didn't make all of them, by Dove Brothers, who were, of course, a local firm, under the supervision of Ewan Christian, prolific church builder and extender and architect of the ecclesiastical commissioners. He remodelled the chancel with new offices and vestry, and if um, you compare the two views here, you can see that the carved rear dos um, has gone in the right-hand image behind the altar. And some maps showing the church before and after the addition of the South East Vestry um, in the corner there. The vestry now tried to keep on top of maintenance and repairs, but in 1896, Dove Brothers wrote to the church wardens urging the necessity of repairing the external stonework at an estimated £500. The church dithered over whether to use artificial cement in place of stone between 1898 and 1900 and only managed to raise £300, and the stonework was in a poor state. This was not just opportunism on Dove's part. 
Henry Dove Miller of Milner Square had been the Vicar's Church Warden at Holy Trinity for 20 years until he died in 1897. And Frederick L. Dove of Crouch Hill, one of the directors at the turn of the century, was also an Islington Church Warden at this time. So they took an interest in the buildings outside of their profession. The major restoration of the roof and stonework and the windows and railings had to wait until 1901 to two, by which time the state of the ceiling had deteriorated due to the unsound roof and outside parts of the stone were in danger of falling out. So a hundred years ago, the building was facing similar problems to today. The works were undertaken at a cost of £3,000, so these are major works, by Henry Tasker, who had recently restored the churches of St Mark's Middleton Square and All Saints Caledonian Road. He was or had been um, a local district surveyor. Tasker's works, or Tasker, included a further reordering of the interior. These are his drawings for the removal of the side galleries and the enlargement of the west gallery and the stripping out of the original box pews and replacement with bench seating. He also raised the East End a little more. These alterations were typical of the time. Box pews were regarded as unsightly and unsuitable for new forms of churchmanship, and modern bench pews became the norm. Galleries, removing the galleries created more light, and because there was actually no need for them, they didn't need a 2,000-seater anymore, as the tide of better off residents continued to move out. In 1913, a new choir vestry was added on the northeast side, matching that added by Ewan Christian 45 years earlier. The church was renovated and redecorated and given a new organ screen at the same time. Uh, and these are oriented north-south, um, hence upside down. And the church was decorated at the same time. The vicar, the Reverend Stephen Rees-Jones, wrote to the Ecclesiastical Commissioners in 1914, pleading that nearly £10,000 has been raised in 12 years to carry out building and repairing schemes in the parish. The people, his parishioners, have never had a rest and are feeling the strain. The commissioners are actual landlords in the parish, and sympathy for the tenants means sympathy for us. He needs money. This small civilian night patrol book was found in the crypt by a church warden in the 1960s. It tells us who was on patrol, sometimes where they lived locally, and indicates that some were either very young or had trouble with writing and spelling. And it also tells us that the crypt was used as an air raid shelter. Parish magazines and leaflets are a good source of local news, fundraising imperatives, and images of a change in church building or at least they are in the case of Holy Trinity. Um, they also confirmed that 1,700 people sheltered nightly between the church during Zeppelin raids and that they were using the old entrance to the crypt. In 1920, a memorial chapel with a Gothic screen was formed in the southeast corner of the church. Uh, the screen was a gift in memory of church warden Thomas Walker and his son, who was killed in the war. And I think that that's what these photographs are recording. They look a little earlier, but I think that's the date. At the same time, memorial windows were placed on the South Isle to remember the Barnsbury lads who had died in the war. And this cartoon is signed and dated H.W. Lonsdale, 1919, which was the year in which he himself died. Raising the money for the memorial chapel of windows was difficult in this increasingly poor area. On the left is one of a series of despairing posters complaining that the necessary enthusiasm and funds could not be raised. And on the right is the eventual notice of the dedication in December 1920. And these are probably written by the Reverend Rhys Jones for parish notice boards. The interior of the church was again redecorated in 1928 at a cost of about 500 pounds, when the paint was carefully scraped from Barry's fine columns. As Rhys Jones wrote happily in the anniversary parish magazine of 1929, how many of those who knew the interior of our church in 1829 would recognize it today? Moving outside again and showing the church between the walls, these are some of the last views of the railings. They came down um, in 1939 or 40, leaving the church vulnerable um, to watch 
the vestry minutes said was extensive and willful damage by children until they were replaced by cheap wire netting in 1947. We found no records of the crypt being used as an air raid shelter in the Second World War. But Andrew Culver, the environmental consultant on the Cloudsley Centre restoration project, has recently identified a World War II helmet beneath the church. And this is his photograph. After the war, I could find no pictures of immediately after the war, so this is 1943, the number of churchgoers continued to dwindle. Now in a sorry state, war damage repairs, um, mostly to the glazing, um, but also to possible blast damage to the stonework, including the buttress pinnacles, um, were estimated at 1,250 pounds, but it's still not been un undertaken um, as late as 1951. Dampness was seeping through the southwest wall over the disused gallery due to an ongoing problem with the boiler flue. And outside the church grounds had become a dumping ground. By the early 1960s, the flimsy fence already needed replacing. Meanwhile, the building continued to deteriorate. The wiring was unfit. It cost at least £15 a week to run the church in 1969, and its income was only 12. To cap it all, the church soon had no permanent minister. The future of the church was discussed by the parish and more widely. This report in the North London Press of uh, 1970 gives a range of views on what should happen to it, um, including one who says drop a bomb on it. As the author noted, um, and he was in favour of perverse, uh, preserving the church, admittedly the church is not a strong centre of local life, but leaving aside the pubs, isn't it almost the only centre of local life? And while in a very poor state, it was still of course the architectural focus of the square. After nearly a decade of discussion about its future, the church was formally made redundant in 1978. The legal effects of consecration to the building above the ground um, were removed and ownership was vested with the Diocese of London. The Celestial Church of Christ became its tenants in 1979. The building continued to deteriorate though and was placed on the Heritage at Risk Register in 2005, um, classed as Category A meaning at risk of immediate loss. Technical support and substantial funding for critical roof repairs from Historic England and also funding from the Architectural Heritage Fund, the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and the Pilgrim Trust um, and the Mayor's Fund will help save the church, we hope, for the future. Perhaps the requirement of 1818 to be built big halls for the crowds of new church growers was to be the saving of these buildings 200 years later, architectural historian Gillian Darley commented recently about commissioners churches and we certainly hope that's the case for Holy Trinity, Cloudsley Square and I, I think I'll stop there. Are you there Rosie? I am, I am, hang on. Would you like me to stop sharing my screen? Um, why not? Yes, please. Um, thank you very much for that. I think that was extremely interesting. Um, oh, look, you're getting claps. Oh, well, that's good. Um, I was worried I was teaching people everything that they already knew. So. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions? Maybe stick up a hand and unmute yourself. If you want to field them. Um, I will try to. I can't actually see any hands at the moment. Jenny. Oh, I see a hand. I see a James. James. If you there are questions about the present state of the building and going forward, they must be addressed to Rosie. Okay, but James, do you want to unmute wherever you've gone? Oh, you're there. Um, was there a, can you hear me now? Yes. Right. Um, in the, was it ever any subject to any high church movement to improve the chancel and according to the, the Catholic revival or, was it, or has it always been um, uh, an altar rather than, it, it looks very much like um, an 18th, a 19th, early 19th century preaching box as we call them in the north but um, 
was anybody was anybody involved with the Catholic revival in improve in kind of improve the uh, the East End according to Catholic principles? Do you know? Um, well, it's a very good question. And those two periods of works, eighteen sixty seven, by you and Christian, and then yes. by Henry Tasker, those are rather gentle implementations of the high church movement to right. push the fo focus away from the preaching box to the altar. So you're absolutely right. It's not as radical as some um, churches. And I suspect there might have been protests from the parishioners if it were, but that's what those are about. The reason why I ask, I've done a lot of work. I, I'm from the North, I'm David Gibson's brother. Um, and I did a lot of work on Cheshire churches, the Victorian, um, uh, impact the Victorian impact on Cheshire churches and that was one of the major things that happened in Cheshire was the the Catholic revival and the ecclesiological movement you know to, to move more to uh, to a Catholic ritual rather than 18th century preaching boxes so I just wondered how it might have worked down south in London that's all. Um, very much so um, it varied according to parish and it was relatively mild um, but no that's a very good question but yes mm. it's similar. Well, a lot of, in, in, in early churches in Cheshire, a lot of Lancet windows went, and then early English uh, great east windows were put in. Um, organs were improved, and, as it, and also the galleries were removed as well in quite a few churches. You know, to, 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 um, in fact, a lot of the faculties in the Cheshire Record Office say it was all done for the dignity of worship. That was the... That was the, that was the two words um, or three words that was, were used to justify those reorderings of the late 19th century, 19th century and the Catholic revival. Anyway, thank you very much. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you for your question. I'll unmute now if I can. Nick, do you want, uh, do you want to go next? Unmute, unmute. Couple of questions. Great, great talk, by the way, Rebecca. Thank you, Nick. Very nice entertaining. Um, first one is: um, What's the significance of the term "chapel of ease"? It, literally, it eases the parish church, which is overcrowded. Oh, I get it. Um, yeah. yeah, I should have explained it. Yeah. it and more happen over time, and then they often, usually be, uh, are assigned their own parishes, so they are all part yeah. of the mother church. Um, but that's normally the way that the new churches um, were created within existing parishes. There's not the ease of the people. It's no, not it, people it's going there. The pressure on ease, yeah, St Mary know. and also St Mary yeah. Magdalene by that date. Okay, and the second question is, can you give us any sense of how important the vestry was as a kind of local community? We're, were they sort of like the local council today? Absolutely. Or, yeah. So this is um, a, um, a body of civil administration as well as um, divine, um, looking at divine matters. Um, the vestry minutes are only recorded annually. So it's difficult to get a sense of exactly what's getting on, going on. Most of that would have been done at St. Mary, was the short answer, um, as a, you know, the main parish church. But they are managing stuff, stuff, you know, things in their... Like education own, like, and so on. Yes, but gradually other organisations take that on. And around the turn of the century in, in London, that moves over to, you know, the borough. But it's a really good question and it's hugely diverting reading vestry minutes and church wardens accounts. I mean, I was obviously interested primarily in the building in this, but it really does tell you about the sorts of people. There's a really, really high turnover of um, church wardens and vestrymen initially. Mm. And I don't know, it seems, it's, it seemed to be a much higher turnover than I've seen in central London. But, you know, I don't know if they fell out or if that's just the way things were. Um, but it's, it's hugely interesting. Mm. And they weren't elected or anything. They were, they were just... Oh, goodness, I've forgotten how this works. No, it's a kind of appointment, I think. Um, it's sort of the great and the good. Yeah, as I say, the, dev, the doves were church wardens and 
Susan and the volunteers look more at the individuals involved. Um, I was trying to stick to bricks and mortar, although it was, it was difficult to not wander. But I think that they could probably answer those questions better, certainly for the, the period they were looking at up to the mid-century when burials stopped. And several of them, I imagine, were buried in the church itself. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question from Charles. Need to unmute. Yeah, he's trying. You can tell. Is it? Yes, brilliant. Like that. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, I'm the representative deputy of Tenant Risington. I have a particular interest because I was born in Liverpool Road in what used to be the City of London Maternity Hospital and lived in Theverton Street. And I, I called in to, to the church a couple of days ago. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed in with all the work going on. But um, and so I greatly look forward to seeing it in, in the flesh once the works have been carried out. I wonder if you could give me some indication of the timings of, of, of the works and when this great project might be um, near completion. Oh, well, um, at the moment we are repairing uh, just the aisle roofs. We've received funding from Historic England um, and the diocese has put in some match funding. So that's just what's being repaired at the moment. We've still got to fundraise for um, the main repairs to the building and that will take another couple of years. So um, uh, initially the, uh, the South Nile roof has just completed and the scaffolding should be being struck as we speak. Well, not obviously as we speak because it's too late, but um, this week, next week. And um, work has commenced on the North Isle roof, and that is due to finish at the end of January. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I can't see any. Sort of going, going, gone. Shall I? Um, just very briefly tell you about the exhibition. So we have, um, sadly, the exhibition from the Tales from the Crypt uh, was due to open at Islington Museum um, in March. Funnily enough, that didn't happen. So um, we have taken down um, the uh, boards and the uh, artwork from the pupils from New River College and moved it all up to um, the Cloudsley Centre and uh, so the South Isle is now finished and um, the exhibition will be open um, from Saturday mornings from 11 till 2. Um, I have a banner that <laughs> I am going to put on the railings of the church so that you can um, see. It is announced on the Diocese of London website, but I do accept that that's quite hard to try and navigate to find the information. Um, we will start tweeting about it as well, but the reality is it's every Saturday, um, 11 till 2, from this Saturday through till the 28th of November. Um, so that's being manned by um, the Tales from the Crypt volunteers. And um, we have tried to follow all relevant COVID legislation. So there will be a QR code for track and trace. Um, there's sanitizers, there's masks, there's enough space for everybody to spread around. Um, so hopefully some of you will find the time to pop in and have a look. So anyway, um, I think then hopefully that was um, very interesting for everybody. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for that talk. Um, I will give this uh, recording to the diocese and uh, ask them to put it on their website. And then I will send a link to Andrew, uh, who can also disseminate it to people who weren't able to, um, to come. So uh, if there's nothing else, I think thank you all for uh, coming and um, hopefully see some of you at the next talk, which is next month and given by Susan, 
which will be about the stories of the people in the crypt. Rosie, could I just say thank you from the Islington Society for all of you for organising this. It was tremendous and we're very grateful for it. No, you're very welcome. I'm just sorry we can't all go to the pub now and have a drink. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All of us might go anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I would if I were you. So, um, uh, perfect. So hopefully that uh, will be good. And anyway, um, and as I said, Susan will be speaking next month.